Amen. And with that, we do dismiss the kids today. The nursery is open if you want to partake of that. Kid zone is open. Well, again, I want to thank you all for praying for, uh, for Deb and I while we were away. We had a great time while we were on vacation, uh, traveling and visiting family, hiking and camping and canoeing. Uh, but it's very good to be back here at KAC with you today. And I pray that you will have an opportunity, if you haven't already, that you will have an opportunity as we did to enjoy the summer with some time off. To know the warmth of the morning sun shining through the trees. To know the peacefulness of the wind rustling the leaves. The serenity of the early morning bird song. To drink in the sounds and the sights and the wonder and the joy of God's glorious creation. You know, to me, that's, that's what summer is about, is enjoying that. Obviously, and also visiting friends and family, of course, because sometimes we rarely get to visit those who live in far-off places. And yet, as wonderful and as beneficial as God's creation is, and the, the general revelation of God through His creation, how much more instructive is the specific revelation of His Word, His timeless Word. Praise the Lord. And that's what we're going to look at today in this message. Because it's a break from routine, I always, in the summer, I, I, I change my devotional life up. I don't know if you do the same, but in summer, I do tend to focus on His creation. I focus on Sabbath rest, and I focus on reading and studying the Psalms. Because there's no end of depth to going into the Psalms. And it's helpful, really, that ever since July the 2nd, we've been in the series called Summer in the Psalms. And each week we've been brought one, a, a message based on one of the 150 Psalms in the Bible. The book of Psalms is the longest of the books in the Bible, if you didn't know that. There's 66 books in the Bible. This is the longest book, 150 chapters, and every chapter is a poem, a, a reading, a song, a prayer. And like any song or poem or reading or prayer, they're, they're meant to be used repeatedly, to be sung over and over again, to be read over and over again, to be prayed as often as needed, to be meditated on and to be memorized. Because though they are songs and poems and readings and prayers, they are sacred. They're the Word of God to us, part of Holy Scripture. And as 2 Timothy 3 puts it, God breathed and useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In preparation for my absence during July, I asked our guest speakers to speak from their, from their favorite psalm. I don't know what you have. I Hopefully you have a favorite psalm. If you haven't, then I would encourage you to read through the book and pick one uh, that, you would, uh, that particularly speaks to you, perhaps. And subsequently, on July 2nd, we heard from Mark Godry on Psalm 65. On the 9th, we heard from Dennis and Sarah on Psalm 51. On the 16th, we heard from Amanda Corbin on Psalm 96. And last week, from Betty and Victor on Psalm 105. And each of those messages was built on the foundation of the prior series about doing the work of a disciple and brought us something more to consider and apply in the context of our own individual lives. And we're going to continue that through the rest of this summer. From now till Labor Day, we'll continue in Summer of the Psalms, building to our fall kickoff on the 10th of September. But today we come to Psalm number 1. You can see that in the front of your bulletin the very first chapter of this magnificent book of Scripture. Now, if you've been in church for some number of years, you may have heard a message already on Psalm 1, and so maybe you're preparing yourself already for some measure of disappointment. But I do want to encourage you that I am not going to approach the psalm as most do from this on, on this day. Uh, our message is entitled, Whatever They Do Prospers. You'll, you'll notice the missing S in the, in the bulletin. It's not whatever he does proper, whatever he does prospers. You might want to change that there in your bulletin. And really, this message is a kind of introduction to the series, even though we're partway through the series. 
it's an introduction. It's important to have an introduction. Uh, I, to that end, we sent out an, a link in the email uh, to the, inter, the overview video of the Book of Psalms. I hope we, you had a chance to watch that. I highly recommend it. It's a very informative nine minutes of your time. And you'll notice if you did watch it that Psalms 1 and 2 actually together form an introduction to the book of Psalms. Introductions are critical parts of every book. They tell us something of what we're going to find in the book, but they do more than just give us a taste of it. They, they tell us what's needed and necessary in order to really understand what's in the book. Perhaps you didn't know that. Like most of you, during the summer I read a novel or two, and oftentimes I pick that novel by going to some bookstore. I always want to have a paper copy when I'm on vacation for some reason. I still don't understand, because everything else I read is electronic. But for some reason in the summer I want a paper copy. And so I go to the bookstore and I, I browse a fiction section or a travel section. I like those kinds of books. And I'll pick up a book and I'll look at the front of the cover and I'll look at the back cover and maybe I'll flip it open and, and, and read a page or two in the middle and see if it resonates with me. Um, but though I do that, all that time there is an introduction to the book written right at the beginning of it for that very purpose, to demonstrate to the reader what the book is about. And Psalm 1 does that for the book of Psalms. It does it in conjunction with Psalm 2 because together they form the introduction. And I tell you that because as we go through this week's message and next month we're going to spend on Psalm 2, we're going to see how the author of the whole of the book of Psalms, how he penned all 150 through the handwriting of many different people over about a thousand years, how God himself as author put this introduction into the book, giving us, giving us needed facts to understanding what the book as a whole is about. And having that as the backdrop in your mind when you read each one of the Psalms is actually critical to understanding and getting the most from each of those readings. Today we're going to dig then into Psalm 1 as the introduction, even though we're partway through the series on the book of Psalms already. But before we turn there, let's turn to the Lord again in prayer. Now, Lord, as we open your word, we come to this part of the service, Father God, where we we look especially to your spirit to, to, to take these words, Lord, and to instill them into who we are, to make them part of us, Lord, that we would live them out in the days ahead. Perhaps even just in the, in the next week ahead. Father God, perhaps even later today. That we would live them out, Father, not just now, but every day of our lives on a moving forward basis. Father, that we become more like you. And to that end, Father God, we pray and to that end we ask, in Jesus' name, amen. So open your Bibles if you brought them with you. There's a pew Bible ahead of you. If you didn't, navigate there in your device, as the case may be. If you have a paper Bible, the book of Psalms is easy to find. It's like Genesis, which is the first book, easy to find right at the beginning, or Revelation, the last book, easy to find right at the end. And the Psalms, if you just let your Bible flip open into the middle, you're going to find yourself in the book of Psalms. It's in the middle of our Bibles. And if you let it flip open into the middle, let it flop open in the middle, let it flip back a little bit back towards the front, and there you'll be at Psalm 1. And while you do that, let me give you a little bit of trivia that the book of Psalms was not always in the middle of the Bible. It was part of the, the book of Psalms is the first part of the last part of the three parts of the Jewish Bible, because that's where we get our Bible, of course. That's the Old Testament is the Jewish Bible. But in the Jewish Bible, the books of the Old Testament are arranged differently. They're arranged into three parts. There's the Torah, what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, just as we have them. That part stays the same. But then they have the prophets. And the, pro and the book of the prophets in the Jewish Bible begins with the book of Joshua. And then they have the writings. So you've got the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And so, so we have two divisions in our Bible. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the, the Jews take the Old Testament and have three divisions in it. They have the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And the writings begin with the book of Psalms. And as a book, the Psalms have an introduction followed by five books. If you actually read through it, you'll see there's book one, book two, book three, book four, and book five. Just like there's five books in the opening of the Old Testament in the Torah. In fact, uh, the opening of the whole of the Bible, Genesis, 
1 to 11, and the introduction to the book of Psalms, Psalms 1 and 2, and then you have the rest of the, of, of the, of the, the, uh, the word there. And the five books that make up the rest of the whole of the Psalms each end with a doxology. If you've ever noticed that, uh, you'll see that each one of those endings ends with a doxology, and each one of those books is filled with songs and poems and readings and prayers that directly apply to all of us who seek God's face in worship and in prayer. And then when you look at it that way, you start to realize that the book of Psalms is actually like another Torah. The first Torah, the first five books, the Pentateuch, what we have, we might consider that a primer in sound theology. And the book of Psalms then is a testimony of practicum. It is a testimony of what it means to live out the theology of the Torah. And I think knowing that adds some depth and value as we read through it. And so today we're going to be, start off then by reading through Psalm 1. Why don't we stand, because we've been sitting for a while now. Let's stand with me then for the reading of God's sacred word. And I'm going to read from the 1984 version of the, new I, of the NIV, the New International Version. You can follow along in whatever version you have. But to help absorb the text, I'm going to read the first two verses and the last uh, two verses, and we'll read verse 3 together. I'll put the, the words on the screen behind us here, okay? So I'm going to read the first two verses. We'll all read verse 3 together, and then I'll read the last two verses. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Together then. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Amen. Thanks be to the Lord for the reading of his word. You may be seated. You will notice that the title of today's message is the end of verse 3 there. Whatever he does prospers. In the ESV it says, in all that he does, he prospers. Perhaps it's better in the latest edition of the NIV. It says, whatever they do prospers. For in the, in the Hebrew, the intention there is to speak of the blessed, and the blessed of God are both male and female. So don't get taken uh, off track by the reading of the 1984 version there. Understand it means all of God's people who are blessed. And to that end, I like how the message version actually puts it. It says, you're like a tree planted in Eden, bearing fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. Oh, I like that. You like that? Wouldn't it be great to have that said of you? To have that said of us? That, 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 that everything we do would work out great. That everything we put our hands to would become blessing and fulfillment and provision and joy and delight. To live a life uh, completely filled of peace and joy and wonder. That whatever we do would prosper. To have nothing end in failure. To have nothing, no plan, no project, no activity. Nothing come to disaster. But, the, but nothing that comes to grief. None of your plans that comes to pain. No striving, no struggle arising from an effort to accomplish anything. But everything you go to do just works out great. Just fresh fruit every month. Never dropping a leaf. Always in blossom. Friend, that is the life that God is calling His people to. That is the life that God is calling His people to. And make no mistake, that is the life that we wind up with when we faithfully follow Him. And that's where we're headed if we are His people, His faithful people. 
And I say if because the introduction to the introduction of the book of Psalms is about a choice, a choice that results in action. It says, blessed is the man who does. Who does? The disciple of God is not just a decision maker. Of course, one must decide to follow God. That's an absolutely needed and critical step. But friend, it's just the first step. It's the first step. The fruit of that decision then gets borne out in how we live after that first step. Let me read it to you again in the 2011 version of the NIV. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on His law day and night. Now you could have a whole message just on those first two verses, but I'm not going to spend that much time on them this morning. Other than just to notice here that there's five descriptions of the blessed. Three negative ones and two positive ones of the blessed individual. Of the individual that God purposes to bless forever and ever and ever. It says the disciple of God, the blessed individual, does not walk in step with the wicked. That's one negative description. It says they do not stand in the way that sinners take. That's a second negative description. It says they do not sit in the company of of mockers. That's a third negative description. And then there's two positive ones. It says that instead their delight is, one, one might read it as, who does delight in the law of the Lord. That's a very positive description. It's describing someone who finds joy in doing what God says. And then it adds, who meditates. One might read, who does meditate on his law day and night. That's a, very, that's a second very positive description. It's describing someone who thinks about, someone who ponders and concerns themselves with how to apply and live out what God says in His Word. The original Hebrew word there is haga. It means to deeply reflect on a matter. To spend significant time pondering the personal application of what God said in Scripture. I'm not going to go too much on here about the negative progression of walking and then standing and then sitting. You know, this, this slowing down of movement. There's much profit in pondering that, and you can do that after this message. But what I want us to realize today is that this is really, this, these first two verses is a kind of a reiteration of God's original call to those He made in His image. It's a restatement of what God said to Adam and Eve way back in the beginning. And I want you to follow me on this line of thought. Consider that the story of Genesis opened in the Torah, in the, in the Pentateuch, the very first beginning part of the Bible. It opened with God creating all and then the Spirit hovering over the waters that we might understand that God was, was and is separate from creation. And in Psalm 1, the godly neither stand nor walk nor sit with sinners. They're separate from the ungodly. They're called out. They don't, they're not with the ungodly from that perspective. They, they're not participating in the activities of the ungodly. And recall that in the beginning, at the opening of the Bible in Genesis, God made this beautiful and ridiculously abundant creation, this world, this flawless environment to support the life of of his final creation of humankind. And God said to Adam, who he put in the garden, he said, you're free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. In other words, the man that God made in his image had to think about what God had just said and about how to, how to apply it to make a choice to honor God and then to make a choice to live out honoring God every day of his life. If Adam did that, 
if Eve did that, they would live forever in the paradise of God, in, in the presence of God. They would live the abundant life if only they chose to honor God first of all. If he just chose to honor God as God, first of all. By the way, theologians call that the Edemic Covenant, the covenant that God made with all of humankind prior to the fall, prior to the entry of sin into our existence. The everlasting covenant that God made with us was that if we honored him as God, we would live the blessed life, the abundant life. Friend, God, in His great grace, gives us that same choice today. He gives us that same choice today. He says if we choose to honor Him, if we choose to think deeply on everything that He instructs us to in His Word, if we then live out that accordingly, according to everything that He wrote in His covenant with us, we can live the blessed life. We can yet live the blessed life the life that humankind was supposed to live from the get-go, a life of bearing fresh fruit every month, never dropping leaf, always in blossom. And it's telling, isn't it, that the, the psalmist specifically uses this language. He says, he is like a tree planted by streams of water. And the image that comes to mind is immediately that of the tree of life. It's the tree of life, not the tree that brings death, but the tree that brings life, the tree that Scripture specifically says yields its fruit in season and whose life, whose leaf does not wither. The psalmist wants us to remember what it was like back in the Garden of Eden. And he says this is the way back to that. The way back is all here in the Word of God. The way back to the life God meant for us is revealed in the Word of God to us. Say that with me. The way back to the life God meant for us is revealed in the Word of God. Praise the Lord. Now we who live in our day, you know, the psalmist is just looking back then at the Pentateuch and the scrolls of the prophets and the writings, but we get to look back to the whole of the Word of God, not just to the Torah of the first five books, not even to the whole of the Old Testament, and not even really to the whole of the New Testament, because we get to look back at Christ, who is the Word of God incarnate. Because we, on this side of history, we can recognize Him as the Word of God incarnate, because the New Testament said of Him, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Christ specifically called himself that. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And praise God, Christ made a covenant with everyone who calls on his name. And he took up the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. So you and I can know that we don't need to be a Jewish person to gain a relationship with God. All Jew and non-Jew alike can gain a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And even here in the Old Testament, we're seeing this principle pointed out. Because you know, you can only know such things if you actually read the Word of God, if you actually think about what God says in His Word, if you actually think about how to apply that in the context of your own life. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on His law day and night. Friend, the way back to the life that God me meant for us, the life God means for us, is revealed to us here in the Word of God, in your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible today, you, you are not going to leave here without one, because I'm going to make sure I give you one. There's a stack right there on the way out, next to the offering box on the way out of the sanctuary. You can pick one of those up. And if we run out, I will go get more from my office. You might have a Bible. You need to have the Word of God. You need to be able to read the Word of God. I can almost hear someone saying, yes, Marcus, but I have the Word. And though I've called on the name of God, and though I'm reading my Bible, I'm not finding the life 
that, 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 a fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. My life, Pastor Marcus, my life has lots of struggle. There's striving and there's disappointments day by day and week by week and year by year. Where then, Marcus, is this life of moving from glory to glory that you so describe? Many have trouble seeing that. But my friend, I want to point out to you that it is not me that's describing this life. It is God himself. And it is God himself who promises this kind of life to you right here in Psalm 1. And not only in Psalm 1, but also elsewhere in Scripture. You can even see it in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 3 when Paul writes the same thing using different words, saying we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Or as the King James puts it, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Praise the Lord. Meaning that this life of discipleship is the path to this life of being fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. It is a process. It's a path toward that. It is not that we step into a relationship with God, we make this decision for Christ, and then boom, everything we do from there on in is blessed, and we have just this wonderful, wonderful life. This is no prosperity gospel here, friend. No, no, it's a process because we're sinners and we live in a sinful world. And it's a long journey, as it were, to the promised land. A lifetime of a discipleship before we enter an eternity of blessedness. But friend, eternity will come. Eternity will come. And all who make Christ the Word of God, their delight, all who meditate on what God said and what God promised, all who live as His disciples now will get there. Praise the Lord. We will get there. That's the promise of Psalm 1. Not that we'll get it right now, but that we will get there. We do not declare it and it is so because it's not a prosperity gospel and we're not God. We have a ways to go, but we will be there and get there by God's continued grace to us. We will come to a life that does not end in mortality. We will attain bodies that are not corruptible. We will live in the kingdom of Jesus Christ where whatever we do will prosper. Glory to God. Because you know what? Whatever we do will be what God wants us to do. And of the increase of His peace and of His kingdom, there is no end. And so we will go from peace to wonder and from wonder to joy and from joy to peace and back to wonder, from glory to glory. Everything we do, prospering. Praise ye the Lord. Someone's thinking, Well, that's great, Pastor Marcus, but you know, that's a long way off. And as Robbie Robertson once said, what about now? What about now? By the way, it's a good song if you know it. What about now in the walk of a lifetime? When you know it's the right time, bring it to me now. I can't wait, I can't wait till the ship comes in. I can't wait, I can't wait. Starting all over again. The errors of a wise man make the rules for a fool. What about now? Yet the truth of Scripture applies to the here and now just as much as it applies to eternity. The truth of the matter is that we are here and now with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror. Meaning, when we take the Word of God, when we make the Word of God our delight, when we read it, when we study it, when we meditate on it day and night, then we perceive and we understand and we know something of the glory of the Lord, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And when we do that, by the grace of God and by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, we see more of Him. We see more of Jesus. And perceiving Him and making Him in His will more and more part of our lives, we find ourselves being transformed into His image. We find ourselves being made more and more like Jesus, going from glory to glory. Is God's glory, is it not, that you are something like Jesus? 
Even if you've not yet called on His name, you're made in His image. You have something of Jesus. And when you call on His name and you follow after Him, you're made more and more and more like Him. And even this side of eternity, we find ourselves becoming more like Christ as we live out the Word of God. Friends, that's the promise of Psalm 1. That's the introduction to this wonderful book of Scripture, this, that, that living as God intends us to live, this life of pursuing godliness is anything except a waste of time. It's not wasted in any respect, even though you might struggle from time to time, even though we might strive to live rightly in the face of various circumstances and the hardships that come across and the trials and tribulations that are part of all of our lives. Rather, it is this very path that blesses us even now as it, because it sets us up for an eternity of wonder and joy and peace. We get to live the Christ life now, this week, this month, this year, this lifetime, and as we do so, we gain more of Him day by day, and all the more as we ponder His Word and apply Scripture to the context of our lives, and we get to bring wonder and joy and peace to others as we reflect Him, as we think about and share what God is saying to us, what He's doing in our lives, how God is changing our character day by day into more and more of Christ. Didn't Betty and Victor just share that last week? That very thing. Praise the Lord. And when it's all done, we get to spend eternity with Him, living life as it was meant to be lived, where everything we do prospers. A life of bearing fresh fruit every month, never dropping a leaf, always in blossom. Praise the Lord. Now that's for those who choose to follow the Lord. Those who choose to, to read and study and meditate on His Word and apply it in the context of their lives. But it says, not so the wicked. The wicked don't get to share that outlook. They do not share our journey they do not share our mindset, they do not share our worldview, and they do not share our destination. Those who choose to ignore God's timeless instruction will find themselves going the way of this fallen world. And if Psalm 1 reminds us of the beginning of Scripture by means of the garden and the tree of life, then it also reminds us of the end of Scripture by means of the destruction of the wicked and the coming conclusion to the all that is stained by sin. For in speaking of the wicked, the psalmist states, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. You know, while we were gone and we were camping, we had campfires. If you've ever had a campfire, you know that some ash comes up from the campfire, and it blows away. You don't see it anymore. It's gone. It disappears. And that's the way of the wicked. That's what's going to happen. One commentator said the end of the wicked may not be clear while they're alive and busying themselves with wickedness, but from God's perspective, the wicked have no future at all. They're not going to be able to withstand the judgment of God. And when I read that, I was reminded of Second Peter where the Lord said, you must understand then in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They'll say, where's this coming that he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Second Peter says, but they forget, they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, the world at that time was flooded and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. The wicked do not honor God. They do not look for God. They do not expect God. And therefore, friend, they do not come to immortality. And they do not come to incorruptibility. Because when God inevitably breaks into our domain from His domain of heaven, then their bodies will be reduced to ash. Ultimately, they are left only with what they themselves called into creation, which is nothing at all. And their souls 
condemned to an eternity apart from God. Because God made all. And God made all for His purposes and for His glory. And what is not to His purposes and what is not to His glory, what refuses His grace, is ultimately discarded. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And that's what that word perish means. Psalm 1 is intended to direct the reader's heart back to creation. It's a reminder that God meant all who are made in His image to follow His word, to follow what He wants, His way, His direction, because He made us and He made us to live this abundant life. And by calling us back to the Garden of Eden, the writer of Psalm 1 points us to the future. That in eternity, in the restored world to come, that God will yet bring all of His people to, the godly will prosper in everything they do. But the wicked will not enjoy that. They will come to complete and utter ruin. And those two paths being pointed out, the reader is driven to a choice. The Word of God, just as the Word incarnate, drives us always to a decision. And in Psalm 1, you're confronted with a choice. Are you going to live for God or not? And I wonder if the unnamed author of Psalm 1 is Moses. Because when I read this psalm, I can almost hear the choice that Moses gave God's people after laying out for them, after reminding them at the end of Deuteronomy, reminding them, reading through the whole scroll, everything he had written down at the conclusion of the Torah, when after he had written all his meetings with God in the tabernacle, Moses recited them to the nation, and then he said to Israel, he said, now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you, it's not beyond your reach, it's not up in heaven, So you have to say, well, who will go up to heaven and get it and proclaim it to us that we might obey it? It's not beyond the sea so that you have to ask who will go across the sea and get it and come and proclaim it to us so we might obey it. Moses said, no, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. And that's actually why we stood and read the word this morning, that it might be in our mouths and in our hearts to obey it. See, Moses said, just as the psalm does, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commands, His decrees and laws, and then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will be certainly destroyed. This day, Moses said, this day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life. Choose life. That's the central message of Psalm 1. Choose life. Choose the way of God. Choose to delight yourself in the Word of God. To, to walk the way of God. To meditate on the, all that God says. To think about what He said in the morning. To think about what He said at night. To, to talk about it with your neighbors, with your friends, and with your family. Choose life. Friend, you can do that today. You can do that today. And if you've never called on the name of Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul... You can do that today. You can start on this on this journey, this walk that leads to an eternity of prosper, prospering. You can turn to the Lord and confess to Him how you've dishonored Him, how you've ignored Him, how you've disregarded what He wrote up until this point. And you, you ask Him to forgive you. you. He will wash away all your guilt. He will wash away all your shame. And He will start you on that walk. And I can tell you that truly, that that will happen on account of the grace of Christ, that Christ will forgive you. I promise you that because Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. So you can know that. If you turn to Christ, you can start on this path. It's not too late. For my Father's will, Jesus said, is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Friends, that's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
that you and I can know what salvation is. We can know what it is to walk this good way, the good road that David Smith would talk about. That there'll be no judgment against us on that last day and that whatever we do in eternity will prosper. So if you have not already done so, friend, I encourage you, give your life to Jesus Christ today. Turn to Him. Delight in Him. And He will give you the desires of your heart. And if you want to do that today, I'm going to encourage you after the service, talk to me, talk to one of our elders. Talk to the person who brought you to church. Because if you do that, we want to help pray with you. That you would, we, we, we want to celebrate that with you. That you've turned to Him. That you will be on the path of discipleship, honoring God and all that He said from this day forward. And friend, if you already know Christ, and I trust that most here have already known Christ, that you've already called on Christ, if you're already enjoying a relationship with Him, then take the psalm to heart. Dig into the Word. Dig into it. Meditate on it. Think about it every morning. Think about it every night. Take a vacation for sure, absolutely, and rest mentally and physically, of course, but don't take a break from your relationship with God. Don't take a break from your relationship with His Word. Find peace and wonder and joy in digging into the Word. Find refreshment in the Word of God. It always speaks to our circumstances, whatever season we're in. So take some time this summer to study the Psalms, to read them, to sing them, to pray them, and not only find yourself refreshed, but find yourself becoming more and more like Jesus Christ day by day. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, your word is so refreshing. And every time we come to it, Lord, it's, it's as though it's new to us. I wonder how many times I've read Psalm 1, Lord. And yet when I studied it for this message, it is as though it is brand new to me. It's full of wonder and full of delight, full of things I hadn't seen before. Father, every part of your word is like that. It speaks right to who we are, right to the core of our being gives us what we need for today. Lord, help us to live out your word, to not only read it, but to study it, to meditate on it, to really think it through, that we would live more like you, more like Jesus, so that other people who know us would say, there's something about you. What is it? And we could say, it's because of Christ, the hope of glory in me, that you would receive praise and glory. Father, we ask for these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship.